everyone. Good afternoon, museum patrons. My name is Diana Bolander, and I'm the assistant director slash curator here at the Rar West Art Museum. I'm really excited to continue doing these little show and tells with you today and share a couple of interesting things we have in the collection uh, that we can't share with you in person because of COVID-19. I hope everybody's staying safe and wearing your masks in public so we can open up again soon. Uh, today, we're gonna look at two paintings in the collection. Uh, Floral Still Life and Pink Blossom, which are both by Walt Kuhn. Um, and they're behind me here on the wall. I also have some slides to show you um, so you can get a better look at them. This one here is called uh, Floral Still Life, and it's from 1920, and it was a gift of Mrs. John D. West in 1980. And the other one over here is called Pink Blossom. It's also from 1920 also a gift of Mrs. John D. West, and it's also an oil painting. I'm gonna go ahead and share these slides, because you'll get a better look at the artwork in the slides than you will on the wall here, just because of the quality of the camera that I have. Um, so these two paintings were created by the same artist in the same year, uh, same medium, and they basically have the same subject matter. Here's a good view of floral still life here. Um, it's pretty traditional. Um, and here's another view of Pink Blossom, a bit more abstract. And I wanted to do a quick analysis as we start of the formal formal elements of these works and just take a minute to look closer at them. Um, if we were in person, I would be asking you a bunch of questions and, and guiding you through these, but we really want to look closely and um, Think about what the impact of the artist's choices and how they created shapes and used paints on uh, on us is. Um, so we can see they both have a similar subject matter. Uh, they're both floral still lives. Um, even the the color palette is pretty similar. Um, you see the colors, the pink and the reds and the whites are repeated in both paintings in the flowers themselves. And they both have kind of a mysterious background. Um, and the depiction of space is a little bit different. Um, in the floral still life on the left, we have a, a little bit um, uh, more of what's visible behind there. You can see there's some kind of uh, jar or pitcher or something to the right of the still life. Um, and when you compare that with Pink Blossom, it's still pretty realistic, but the background is very flattened and abstracted and we're not really sure what's behind it. It could be a plant. We have that large green leaf on the right hand side of the canvas, but we're not really sure what's going on in the background there because we just have these broad uh, swaths of color and shape. And the use of light in each is a little bit different too. Um, we don't really have a sense of light in the pink blossom because everything's flattened. Um, but in the other piece, the direction of the, the light is coming from the upper left hand side. It's pretty clear with how he's uh, applied the color and his brush strokes. Uh, both of them have pretty broad, somewhat expressive brush strokes that creates um, texture, uh, the, the floral still life on, on the left, it's pretty expressive actually, um, and it creates a really nice texture and movement across the surface of the painting, especially through the flowers. Um, and he's probably being influenced by the expressionists and the impressionists with that brush stroke. Uh, the, the pink blossom piece, it does have visual, uh, some brushwork that you can see, especially in what I'm gonna call the large olive green abstract leaves near the bottom. Um, but it is again, pretty flattened and abstracted into really basic shapes of what you might see when you see a flower. Um, so one of the reasons I like to talk about these two pieces uh, is because I really think they offer us the chance to pause and ask ourselves how this artist could approach a, such a similar subject matter, same period in his life, same time, and come away with such different images. Um, I think that these two works really offer us the opportunity to think about what was going on in American art at the early part of the 20th century, and um, really see how that is evidenced in a single person's work. 
So, like I said, these two pieces were both painted by Walt Kuhn, and he was a painter and illustrator. He was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1877, and he studied started studying art at a Polytechnic Institute when he went to high school in Brooklyn. Um, when he was a little older, he moved to San Francisco. He worked as a cartoonist, and he started signing his name Walt instead of William. <laughs> and he actually went to Europe to study art um, in 1901 through 1903, and he studied at two academies, the Colorossi in Paris and the Royal Academy in Munich. So he was studying with established artists, learning um, the traditional and accepted uh, standards for art at that time. And although he settled in New York upon his return, uh, that time in Europe really informed his work throughout his career. He became um, pretty well known as a cartoonist for popular magazines, and he also became involved with the planning of the 1913 Armory Show. Um, and he was able to travel to Europe uh, with Arthur B. Davies, to, who was another director of the show, to select avant-garde art for, for this exhibit that really changed a lot about what Americans thought uh, about art, and what was art, and how um, artists uh, abstracted from nature and did a, he did, started to change their approach to art. Uh, one thing that I thought was really interesting about Walt Kuhn was he's not only a fine artist, but he's also acted as an art historian and an advisor. Uh, from 1912 to 1920, he advised John Quinn, who was a wealthy art patron, and he advised him on what French artists to collect. And he also advised someone named Marie Harriman, who was a collector and gallery owner later on in his life in the 1930s. Um, and around this time in the 1920s, he was painting figure studies and still lives that were influenced um, not only by traditional painting, but also by Cubists and Expressionist painters. And gradually he developed a personal style um, in which this is an example of a work a little later in his career from 1932, and he would flatten and simplify his forms. He would often use this dark outline that you see around the face and the hair there, um, and he would have these really bright colors against a dark background. And he was really inspired by uh, showgirls and the circus and those sorts of subjects. So you'll see a lot of those uh, themes repeated in his, his later work. And he died in 1939 excuse me, 1949. Um, so Walt Kuhn was an artist during the development of American modernism. So that was the breaking away of American artists from working in this traditional realistic style of the academy that had this real strong emphasis on beauty and sort of perfection. Um, and the new pieces experimented with abstracting from nature and altering the subjects so they looked differently than what they did in real life. And they achieved that in many different ways. Uh, they would use non-naturalistic colors. Um, you could exaggerate scale or some aspect of a subject. You could flatten the forms into two-dimensional shapes and break them down into the, really their essential shapes and lines versus rendering um, space and texture and a uh, more naturalistic look. Um, like you see here in the William Bouguereau, um, this is the type of painting that the Academy was really pushing. And this is the type of art that Walt Kuhn would have been taught when he was in the academies in Europe. Um, in the 18th and 19th century, uh, successful artists uh, were trained to create realistic works like this in the style of the High Renaissance. Uh, academies and um, artists really began to challenge this this approach to art for a lot of different reasons. Um, and in America, at the time of the Armory Show, and around the time where Walt Kuhn was working, uh, this the reactionary art wasn't really popular yet in America. It hadn't been uh, broadly exposed yet. Um, People like Bouguereau and people like Winslow Homer were very popular in the United States, um, and they were valued over people who challenged the academy. And this piece was also given to us by um, Mrs. John D. West um, when she was establishing a core collection for the museum. Uh, Bouguereau really, um, he really represented the Academy for a lot of people, and he, um, so much so that he was targeted quite a bit and made fun of by the Impressionists in particular. Um, his works were really popular with the Nouveau Riche in America and were seen as status symbols. So if you walked into someone's parlor and saw one of these works, you would know that they had 
really good taste and uh, we're well off enough to uh, commission or purchase a painting. Uh, a few years ago, the Milwaukee Art Museum did a really nice exhibit on him that showed how the pieces came into the country and how they traveled around from family to family and um, really showed the provenance of the, of the works. And that was really interesting. And I think you could still go on their website and look at that and see uh, the history, the provenance, the history of ownership of the pieces and the big names, the, the families who brought those in. It's, it's pretty interesting. Um, and so uh, my point here is that Walt Kroon was really um, well versed in this academic style and teachings about what made quote unquote good art at the time. And he was involved in um, organizing the 1913 Armory Show. And if you talk to art historians, um, they'll talk about the Armory Show a lot um, because it was really influential in the development of um, modern art in America. Um, it was organized by a group of young anti-academy artists, including Walt Kuhn, um, in New York City. And they created an association called the American Painters and Sculptors. And they wanted to put together an exhibit of art that would show um, the artwork of young Americans who were sort of challenging the academy alongside with European pieces that had been challenging the academy for um, a number of decades in some, some cases. Um, and they modeled this um, ex exhibition off of ex exhibitions in Europe. So Kuhn and um, Walter Davies, they went over to um, Europe and visited with artists and collectors and galleries and visited some of these exhibitions and figured out what pieces they wanted to bring over and um, worked out all the details of that. And Kuhn kept very good papers on his process and he eventually uh, wrote up an official pamphlet of how it came to be, which he published eventually as a book in 1963. Um, and if you go online, you can find most of his papers are online. It's pretty interesting. But in 1912, he was traveling around Europe to um, pick out the works and things like that. And the exhibit, which became the famous Armory Show of 1913, took place at the 69th Regiment Armory in New York City. And that was why it was called Armory Show. Um, the organizers really wanted to showcase American art, but also expose Americans to the new modern European forms of art. And they wanted the Americans to see this new art and be able to judge it for themselves. <laughs> Uh, over 87,000 people saw this exhibit in New York before it went on and traveled to Chicago. And there was a pretty significant inflammatory reactionary press coverage. Uh, people were grasping at their pearls, you so to say. Um, and more than any other event at the time, the Armory Show really got Americans talking about avant-garde art and abstraction and really talking about the ultimate question of what is art. Um, it marked really the, the, the start of the American modernist movement. American artists were exploring all these different styles and abstraction to really express the world around them in ways that differed from that of the traditional academy. Uh, one of the pieces that really made a splash, so to say, at the Armory Show was Marcel Duchamp's new Descending a Staircase. Um, it, it was particularly singled out in the media um, and then cartoons, I don't know if you can read it or not, the cartoon here on the right, which was published in March 1913. Um, the caption reads, the rude descending a staircase rush hour at the subway. So um, <laughs> kind of funny. And one critic described it as an explosion of a shingle factory. Um, but when you start looking at the piece, uh, you might not see a nude particularly. You might can't really make out body parts in the same way as you can in the burro. You don't get that soft treatment of the flesh and things like that. But you can see how the subject has been extracted, taken apart, um, and laid across the canvas in this diagonal um, direction. And the effect is is not, and I don't think the desire is not to. Uh, realistically depict the subject, but rather to depict the effect of the object and the movement of the object in space. And I think in, in that way, he's um, pretty successful. Uh, another piece that made a big splash was Henri Matisse's Rouge Madre. Um, and you can see here, uh, he's challenging the conventions of portraiture. The focus is not necessarily on the details of a woman's face, uh, but on the patterning of her dress and of her headdress. Um, and this piece, I believe, is in the Barnes Foundation now. Um, 
and it, it's much different than uh, traditional portraiture was at that time. The flattening of the canvas is pretty extreme and the background's not distinguishable at all. We don't know where, where this woman is and what she's doing. And the model for this piece was actually his wife. And when you put these two pieces next to like the Bougaro, you see the differences pretty, pretty clearly. Um, and Walt Kuhn kept really good records on exhibit, like I said, and he developed a catalog um, that scholars have really come to rely on. He did do one painting that was in the exhibit, we know for sure. It's this work here called Morning. Um, it's now at the Norton Museum of Art, which is down in Florida. Um, uh, and he also purchased art. Um, there's records in the records that shows that he purchased art for his own personal collection from the Armory Show. This painting was uh, purchased by John Quinn, who was the collector that he advised about what to, to purchase for his art collection. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, you can see that brushwork is very expressive. Um, you can maybe see the influence of someone like Van Gogh. Um, this piece by Van Gogh was done much earlier in 1890, um, but this piece was at the Armory Show, and he had a couple other pieces in the show, even though he had been dead for, I think, about 20 years at that point. Um, and Kuhn would have seen this work uh, while planning the show. This work we know was featured in um, one of the shows that he went to in Germany when he was planning the armory show. Um, so we can see how this piece might have influenced the brushwork and the dark outlining that we see around some of the, the figures in this piece. So this gives you a little bit of a background on armory show. And we come back to our paintings, which were done later, um, in about seven years later in 1920. But I think it's really important to look at the armory show and to think about Kuhn's involvement in that exhibit and, and I think the influence that that experience probably had on him as an artist is probably hard to understate or overstate. He was very aware of the trends in modern art and how they were perceived by the public. Um, and it seems to me that he found value in really experimenting with different styles. Um, and I think it's quite astute of Mrs. West to get these two pieces for the museum because I think they do uh, help tell that story of modernism in America. Um, on the left, it's a little bit more traditional. The subjects are true to life and it's generally depicted in a realistic style. Um, there is the loose, loose brush stroke, but you can tell what you're looking at. And on the right, you can see how it's been flattened into more simplified shapes. Um, and there's a lot of contrast in the shading. It doesn't offer the same illusion of three-dimensional space as the one on the left. And like I said, I don't know what Mrs. West was thinking when she was collecting. We do have some notes on um, these pieces. Uh, the floral still life on the left was acquired in 1980 for the museum. And in the um, accession records, we can tell that there's a letter from an artist named Matthew Carone, who we also have worked by him in the collection. And in the letter, he states that he found, he knows Mrs. West is looking for a work by Walt Kuhn, and he found one that a friend had for sale, and that was this piece, which uh, ended up being uh, purchased and, and put in the collection. So we know that she was looking for Walt Kuhn works, but we don't really know what her motivation was. Um, and she she had a lot of variety in what she collected for the museum. And and I say collected for the museum because she, she didn't necessarily buy these pieces to have and hang in, in her home. They came directly into the museum. Um, uh, like I said, we have over 400 works from her overall. Um, so she was collecting with the community in mind, not necessarily for her own personal pleasure or comfort that she got from a work of art. She did seem to be fond of American modernism, and we have other examples of that in the collection, most notably the, the Georgia O'Keeffe piece, but it, it's not exactly clear why she chose these works. Um, yeah, I would love to know more if anyone knows more about why she chose these works. It would be very interesting to know uh, what her thought process was in choosing them. Um, and I think um, aside from just their value as aesthetic objects, these pieces um, really give us the opportunity to look at art closely and think critically about what's around us. Um, it also makes us think about what was going on in those decades in American history. We had mass immigration, an immigration act was put through early. Um, 
you know, I think around 1914, that uh, put literacy tests in. There was the civil rights movement happening, the women's suffrage. Um, the automobile was becoming very popular and changing the way that we traveled. Things like the Panama Canal were opening up. So things were opening up. Um, and things like um, assembly lines were changing how things were being manufactured. There was a lot of change at once. Photography was becoming much more accessible, uh, motion pictures as well. Um, and I think um, a lot of modernism is something it's a reaction to all the change that was happening at the time. Artists were looking for a new language to talk about all this change and express how, how to show that, how to show the progress, how to show movement, other things that were maybe a departure from traditional representation, but they felt that it was a better representation of their ex experience. Um, and I think people like Stuart Davis or Charles DeMuth really um, capture this. But I think the influence of European artists on Kuhn um, are really undeniable. And it's really interesting given his involvement in the Armory Show. And not, not only that showing that movement, but the Armory Show really marks the start of the movement of the center of the art world, sort of going from Paris, where everyone would go to study and learn, and moving to New York City later on, uh, later in the 20th century, especially after World War II, when so many artists um, found refuge in America. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions if anyone has anything um, in the comments. Um, the bulk of this presentation uh, is composed of a lesson plan that I actually put together back in April and a brochure that goes with it. And you can find that on the website if you want to see pictures and, and read more about it. If you go to rawestartmuseum.org and look under educational resources, you'll find it there. And we're always happy to talk with students and teachers, educators about, about these pieces and bring them out if you'd like to share them with your classrooms. We've got a couple more upcoming programs. In two weeks, on Wednesday, December 23rd at 3 o'clock, I'll be pulling out some of our Christmas plates and sharing them with you, a little bit different than today's presentation. Um, and I'm, I'm using these presentations as an opportunity to find out more about things in the collection that I don't know about. So I'm excited to find out what I learned about those plates and share with you. Um, and then this Saturday at 1 p.m., uh, Coolest Coast is going to come back to help us uh, with our final live broadcast with Sonia Vasquez. And she's been working on portraits for the Portrait of Manitowoc project. And I would encourage you to create a portrait and um, submit it, and that will be on exhibit in 2021. And I see Kathy says she wasn't aware of the Armory exhibit. Interesting. So uh, that's nice. And we're also thinking up different topics for more virtual programs. We're hoping to be able to open uh, soon, but in, in case we can't, we're, we're planning more live streams like this. Our director, Greg Badney, is considering doing a program on the furniture in the Roar Parlor, which should be interesting. And then um, we have some recent gifts from the Kohler Foundation of paintings and drawings by Judith Roth. And someone from the Kohler Foundation might come and speak to us about her as an artist and her life, which would be really interesting. But if there are specific things that you're interested in from our collection, you can let us know. Um, you can comment here, or you can send me an email. My email address is on our website, rawestartmuseum.org, and we can look into it. Other, other than that, I don't have much more for you, and I hope you have a wonderful day.